Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We're going to continue now our reading and discussion of the book, The Foundations Under Attack, The Roots of Apostasy, by Michael Dissemlian. And it is my my unhappy misfortune to have to begin... uh, uh, with uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, where we find yet again another perversion of the King James Version of the Bible. And we've talked about this before. My listeners are going to find this repetitious, but this is very disconcerting. Uh, we find the entire purpose of this book if not the sole purpose of this book, is to defend the authorized King James Version of the Bible as God's authentic, providentially preserved Word of God. That if one in the world wishes to know what God has said, one has to go to the authorized King James Version of the Bible and nowhere else. We've proven over and over and over again that there is an agenda of all the in all of these counterfeit Bibles to destroy what God said, to bring into question, if not to destroy, what God said. And we trust the King James Version as the authentic, preserved Word of God. And when somebody molests the King James Version, we're left without a witness in the world. We're left without God's Word. Now, we've trusted the author, Michael DeSemlian, and we've trusted also Dorchester House Publications for preserving, in its renderings of the King James Version, for preserving their original text. And here we find... Even in Second Thessalonians chapter two verse seven, someone, either the author, which seems contradictory because his entire book defends the King James Version, and 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 shows us specifically how the King James Version points to the Antichrist as the papacy. And here we find once again this example of 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, being perverted from the original. Now, if you're following along in the online copy of of the book, we're on page 86 in the middle of the page, and it's important if you're following along to take note of how the King James Version is molested and is perverted. Now, I'm going to read it as it's written in this book, and then I'm going to read it to you how it's written in the authorized King James Version. Now, it says, the King James Version, it asserts that the King James Version says this, quote, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, unquote. In other words, again, for the... How many times have I recorded this? At least three now. At least three instances in this book so far, the word now has been left out of the verse. It should read... For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Okay, there's the justification for the use of the word now. He says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Thessalonians in writing. For the mystery of iniquity. We We ought to know what the mystery of iniquity is. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. 
That's what the true authorized King James Version of the Bible says. This is a misquote, a very strategic misquote of the King James Version. Paul is literally telling the Thessalonians that power, that mystery of iniquity is already at work in their day 2,000 years ago. And it says, only he who now letteth this mystery of iniquity until only he, it says, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then it says, and then that man of sin shall be revealed. Okay, so what, what, what iniquity was already at work in the world? Well, it was the one Daniel prophesied, the fourth and final beast upon the earth. There were four, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and then finally, the Roman. And it was that Roman government that crucified our Christ, our Messiah. It was that Roman government who, in mocking Daniel and the lion's den, fed Christians to the lions in the Colosseum for sport in that Roman Empire. Now, if that's not the mystery of iniquity, I don't know what it is. Well, it wasn't much of a mystery. It proven what it was with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Okay? But that's the mystery of iniquity at that time already at work. And it says of him, only he, the, that current mystery of iniquity, only he who letteth, in other words, he's, he's restraining the rise of something even worse, only he who letteth, only he who now letteth will let or restrain until, until he be taken out of the way. The very fourth and final beast upon the earth was already there. That's why Jesus said these are the last times because Daniel didn't mention a, four, a, a fifth kingdom upon the earth. He only mentioned four, Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecian, and those three had already been conquered by the Roman Empire. That was the fourth and final beast upon the earth, according to Daniel's prophecy. That's why Jesus said these are the last times. Daniel didn't prophesy a fifth kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. So that Roman power was already in existence. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And Rome distinguished itself as that mystery of iniquity when Herod sought to kill Christ in his crib, causing Mary, Joseph, and Jesus to flee to Egypt. Okay? Those two examples are going to seek to kill the Son of God and to prevent him from going to the cross to save us all. That's the mystery of iniquity. No mystery. Or, all right, that same Roman power Paul predicted that it would soon come to an end and be, or rather, undergo a transformation. It says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then that man of sin shall be revealed. In other words, we're going from bad to worse. When that Roman power that sought to crucify Christ, loses power because he has to be taken out of the way before his successor can come to power. The Caesars would never permit someone to overthrow their throne. That was God's business. And had the papacy risen up at that time, the Roman Empire may have, may have destroyed it. But, but Paul is telling the Thessalonians, there is a, the greatest of all evils to come upon the world, and the one that's now existent is not it. As brutal as the, the Caesars were against Bible-believing Christians, he would pale in comparison to the man of sin, son of perdition, the papacy. When the pagan Roman Empire 
baptized itself and became the Holy Roman Empire, the so-called Holy Roman Empire. Trust me, there is not one thing holy about it. It is the mystery of iniquity on steroids. It is the mystery of iniquity with nuclear power. It is the mystery of iniquity that now governs all the kings of the earth and deceives all of God's people. It's infinitely more dangerous, more bloodthirsty, and more against Christians than was the pagan Roman Empire. Now, if you take the word now out of there and read it thus, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. What sense can you make of that? <clears throat> Listen, this is the Apostle Paul trying to tell the Thessalonians, and I have to believe the rest of the body of Christ, wherever they were, because this letter was to be passed around and read among the churches. He was trying to inform God's people, those for whom Christ came and bled and died for, that the power that was already at work persecuting the saints, crucifying Christ, was going to be replaced by an even more wicked kingdom. It would still be Roman. It would still be the fourth empire on the beast, or on the world. But it would be the little horn of Daniel, the son of perdition. Okay? He was trying to warn them that the Roman Empire was about to morph into that mystery of iniquity or the all-deceivableness of unrighteousness. He was talking about the fall of the pagan Roman Empire and the upcoming of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, if you take the word now out of there, you have no indication of who, de who, who Paul was speaking about. Paul was trying to identify the papacy several hundred years before it came to power. And he tried to identify who that Antichrist, who that son of perdition is, by telling the Thessalonians that he would replace the current world evil. It says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In other words, the Caesars. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth the Caesars will let continue to restrain the rise of the son of, the son of perdition until he be taken out of the way. The Caesars be taken out of the way. Now it makes perfect sense. If you put the word now in the passage exactly where the true, authentic, authorized King James Version places it, you have all the information you need to identify who the Antichrist is even hundreds of years before he comes to power. You know he's going to replace the Caesars. And the other vision of Daniel, of, of the fourth and final empire being two legs of iron, all of a sudden makes great, perfect sense. Caesarian Rome became papal Rome. It's still Rome. It's still the iron Roman Empire. Only it just now calls itself holy and it calls itself Christian. And this is conjunction with a great falling away, the great apostasy that Paul spoke, spoke of. And other passages in the scripture that make us certain that the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the antichrist of the Bible, comes out of the church, out of that great apostasy. Now, with that... We'll continue where we left off yesterday on the program, page 86 of the book. And now I will read the New King James rendering of 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. It is also a perversion, a very, very marked perversion. And the rendering of this particular verse as it is given in the New King James Version is how I was taught when I was in the apostate churches. Quote, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, that is capital H-E, meaning the Holy Spirit, 
Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Again, both renderings of the word he are capitalized, indicating that it must be speaking about the Holy Spirit. I touched on that yesterday. God will never take his Holy Spirit away from us and out of this world. And the rapture is a lie, flat out a lie. I was taught that the Holy Spirit would be taken out of this world when those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, true Bible believers, will be raptured out of this world. And then the man of sin will be revealed and the great tribulation begins. It's all nonsense. It's all Jesuit-led, counter-reformation propaganda. And uh, I am blessed of the Lord to be relieved of that grievous misunderstanding and perversion of the Scriptures. And now I am free to believe the truth. And I want my listeners to be free to believe the truth as well. <coughs> now... The author says, Michael Desemlian says, the new King James Version, although considerably closer than other modern versions, is not the King James Version in updated language. In other words, the new King James Version is not a more modern rewrite of the King James Version. It's an altogether different version. Okay? Okay. And it says also, nor is it faithful to the received text, to the majority text, that providentially preserved scripture of the universal priesthood of believers. It is another, if you'll pardon the expression, bastard Bible. It's not from the Father. Okay? It's a fatherless child, this New King James Version. All right? Not from the received text. It does not have the blessing of God. The curse of God is upon these false Bibles. And it says, like other modern versions, it reflects the views and interpretations of its translators and is eclectic in its choice of manuscript readings, often preferring the corrupted minority text to the, rece to the received texts. So it's of mixed heritage. The holy, that is the received text, the majority text, and the profane, the Vatican text. Mixing the holy with the profane. And what blessing can come from God when the holy is mixed with the profane? Now, we have a note at the bottom of the page. Some Bible versions, besides the New King James Version, translate this as he, capital H, not he, small h, small e, which clearly indicates it's speaking of the Holy Spirit. This only allows for a futurist interpretation and a pre-tribulation rapture. See chapter 1 in the book entitled The Historical View of Prophecy and Antichrist, subheading The Man of Sin and Mystery of Iniquity. So this has already been uh, corrected by uh, critics of, of this rendering, this false rendering in the New King James Version indicating of the Holy Spirit, and it's only to support futurist lying interpretation of the Bible and a false rapture that's never going to happen. Oh, I believe, yes, I do indeed believe in the resurrection, as it is given in the Scripture, that comes at the last trump. There's only one last trump. God is not confusing. There's only one last trump. When the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive and remain shall join them together to be with the Lord in the air. And that's the way it's going down. That's the resurrection of the righteous, the first resurrection. 
There's another resurrection the Bible talks about, and that's the resurrection of the unrighteous. The unrighteous dead, and they will live not yet again for a thousand years, the Bible says. So separated by a thousand years is the resurrection of the righteous, then the resurrection of the wicked. The Bible's perfectly clear about it, plain English. No one needs to in, start going about with his own private interpretations. The Bible interprets itself. The authorized King James Bible interprets itself. All the other Bibles require a higher authority than the Bible to interpret. Okay? That's where the Roman Catholic Church gets its teaching, that the church is higher than the Bible, and that the Bible is subject to the church, not the other way around. In the Protestant Reformation, the Bible is the supreme authority, and the church is, sub is, is subservient to the Bible, secondary to the Bible. All right, it's God's voice that speaks in the King James Version. It cannot be gainsaid. And that's the Protestant belief. Now, we're going to move on to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. Here is the quote from the King James Version of the Bible. Quote, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now, here's how it is translated in the New International Version. Quote, in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So what is the difference? The Bible, the authorized King James Version of the Bible emphasizes all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Now, what is it talking about? It says... The coming of the man of sin was to be with, quote, all deceivableness of unrighteousness, unquote. As Protestant pastor and historian James A. Wiley, a Victorian author of the book entitled The History of Protestantism, which we read and discussed verbatim here on Inquisition Update many, many years ago, it says, James A. Wiley said, quote, let us mark the phrase. It is a very remarkable one. It is used in no other place. It is employed to describe no other system. It describes the great apostasy and it alone. It is not simply, quote-unquote, deceivableness, nor is it simply, quote-unquote, unrighteousness. It is, quote, the deceivableness of unrighteousness. Nay, it is the all-deceivableness of unrighteousness. Paganism was a system of deceivableness. It was the worship of a false god under the pretense of being the worship of the true god. But popery is deceivableness on a scale far beyond that of paganism. The one was a counterfeit of the religion of nature. The other is a counterfeit of the gospel. Popery has a God of its own, him whom the canon law calls, quote, the Lord our God, unquote. See the decretals of Pope Gregory the Ninth, Title Seven. The Pope is called God. And also the the, 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 the decretals of Pope Gregory the, uh, the 13th in his distinction number 96, Canon 7. In the Roman Catholic Church, by Roman Catholic canon law, by the decrees of the popes, the Church of, of Rome is to regard the papacy as, quote, the Lord our God, unquote. All right? Now does the word deceivableness of unrighteousness makes sense and how it applies uniquely to the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church has a savior of its own, the church. It has a sacrifice of its own, the mass. It has a mediator of its own, the priesthood. 
It has a sanctifier of its own, the sacraments. It has a justification of its own, that even of infused righteousness. Righteousness, according to the Bible, the authorized King James Bible, is imputed to us. But in the Roman Catholic Church, it is infused righteous, righteousness. In other words, they're perfect in the Roman Catholic Church. They can do no wrong, no matter what they do. They can do no wrong. You see how Rome justifies her wickedness? Roman Catholicism has a motto. The end justifies the means. And if the ends you desire are just, by any means, fair or foul, to achieve it is also just. That's how Romanism perverts the gospel and the law of God. We'll be back with more. From Michael DeSemlian's book, The Foundations Under Attack, The Roots of Apostasy, when we return from the break, you're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Years ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for his holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188.
Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update, and we were in the midst of a lengthy and very, very powerful quote from James A. Wiley, who my listeners are familiar with. He says, speaking of the Roman Catholic Church and the de- the the the, de- the deceivable, my tongue's not working today. The deceivableness of unrighteousness. What is the Bible speaking of? It's speaking specifically of the Roman Catholic Church. It has a savior of its own, the church. It has a sacrifice of its own, the mass. It has a mediator of its own, the priesthood. It has a a, a sanctifier of its own, the sacrament of the mass. It has a justification of its own, that even of infused righteousness. It has a pardon of its own, the pardon of the confessional. It has in the heavens an infallible, all-prevailing advocate unknown to the gospel, the quote-unquote mother of God, speaking of Mary. It thus presents to the world a spiritual and saving apparatus for the salvation of men, which neither sanctifies nor saves anyone. Let me read it again. The Roman Catholic Church, it, thus presents to the world a spiritual and saving apparatus for the salvation of men, which neither sanctifies nor saves anyone. That's the Protestant belief. That is the biblical belief. Okay? the prophetic belief, the historical belief of Bible-believing Christians all throughout the centuries. It presents to the world, the Roman Catholic Church presents to the world a spiritual and saving apparatus for the salvation of men which neither sanctifies nor saves anyone. That's right. The Pope cannot save himself, let alone anyone else. The Pope did not die for anyone's sins. He causes the world to die for him. Okay? Jesus shed his own blood. The papacy sheds the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. See the clear distinction? The Roman Catholic Church looks like a church. It professes to have, to have all that a church ought to have, and yet it is not a church. That's right. It's not a church. It can call its ch- itself a church till the cows come home, but it's not a church. It is a global abomination characterized by all deceivableness of unrighteousness. It presents itself to the world as the last great hope, forsaking Christ, replacing Christ in the world. It's a lie. Continuing with the quote, it says, it is a grand deception. It is, quote, the all-deceivableness of unrighteousness, unquote. And these quotes will sound familiar to my regular listeners. It's from the work, The Papacy is the Antichrist by James A. Wiley, which again, we read in its entirety verbatim right here on Inquisition Update several years ago. Now, we're going to deal with Isaiah, chapter 31, verse 5, and how it is perverted in the counterfeit Bibles. The King James Version, the true word of God, quote, As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it, unquote. The NIV, the New International Version, the Ecumenical Bible, says, quote, Like birds hovering overhead, the Lord Almighty will shield Jerusalem. He will shield it and deliver it. He will pass over it and will rescue it, unquote. And the Good News Bible renders it this way, Just as a bird hovers over its nest to protect its young, so I, the Lord Almighty, will protect Jerusalem and defend it. 
Now, the author Michael Desenlian says, Many Christians who hold to an historical view of Bible prophecy believe that this scripture was actually fulfilled in December 1917. Okay? What happened in December of 1917? He says, The deliverance of Jerusalem from the long-standing Muslim rule of the Ottoman Turks was accomplished in answer to, to the faithful prayer of God's people by the British forces under General Allenby using aeroplanes for the first time in such a campaign. Okay? Was, uh, was God hovering over Jerusalem in those aeroplanes? Does God need aeroplanes? No. That prophecy was not fulfilled in December 1917, even though historicists believe it was. That prophecy, in my opinion, refers to the new Jerusalem. The earthly Jerusalem is no holy place anymore. It is occupied and dominated by Gentiles, and it will be treading down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The time of the Gentiles will not be fulfilled until the resurrection. For the righteous dead are united with Christ. The times of the Gentiles will not end until Jerusalem is fully trodden down. The papacy has designs on Jerusalem in Israel today to fulfill its counterfeit fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, which Jesus completely and perfectly fulfilled 2,000 years ago. Jerusalem today is a false stage created by men to counterfeit what God has already long ago brought to pass. It is designed for one purpose and one purpose only, to deceive the whole world. Now, many of my listeners are going to disagree with this. I can't help it. I can't help it. Now, he says, the modern versions are at variance one with another. And wouldn't you know, most false testimony contradicts other false testimony. Now, you can take true testimony from various testifiers And they will all agree. But when the lies start coming out, the liars can't even agree with one another. It's a perfect indication whether or not you've got the truth. Now, the King James Bible does not contradict itself. The King James Bible is perfect harmonious. There's no division. There's no schism. There's no controversy. But in the modern versions, those attempts to counterfeit the true, there's no harmony. You get frustrated reading one book of lies and compare it with another book of lies. Understand? It's perfectly easy to understand. It's logical. The modern versions, those counterfeits of the true, are at variance one with another. The NIV translation is similar to the King James Bible, but the good news does not allow for such an interpretation at all. Quote, Just as a bird hovers over its nest to protect its young, so I, the Lord Almighty, will protect Jerusalem and defend it. The seriousness of the problem of different translations is perhaps illustrated here as clearly as it is anywhere else. God's prophetic word altered into something entirely different. Totally unrecognizable in comparison to the King James Version of the Bible. Now, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 19. In God's providentially preserved word, King James Version, it is rendered this way, quote, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him, unquote. Now here it is in the counterfeit Bible, the NIV. From the west, men will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. See anything familiar? It says the second part of the scripture is virtually unrecognizable in the NIV. This great word of prophecy is mutilated. And isn't that their intent? 
to mutilate God's word? If Satan were given license, don't you think he would corrupt the entire Bible? And that's what he's doing through these, these unauthorized versions. Satan has a free hand to corrupt God's word. And we give him license by purchasing these false counterfeit Bibles. We are assenting to his perversions. We are responsible to see to it that we pass along to our children and our children's children the true word of God. It's only available in the authorized King James Version. Now, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. In the King James Version, it says, quote, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, what does it say in the Good News Bible? in which there is no good news at all. It says, He said to me, quote, And now, Daniel, close the book and put a seal on it until the end of the world. Many people will waste their efforts trying to understand what is happening. Let me tell you something. I have not wasted one moment of my life trying to understand what is happening. I just read the authorized King James Version and try to understand it because I know in it I have the truth. Those who seek wisdom and knowledge elsewhere are wasting their efforts. The author says the vivid portrayal of life as we now live it in the second half of this verse is obscured entirely in the good news and other modern versions. Mutilated renderings. Mutilated. Satan is having a heyday with all these so-called Bibles. Now, this is the most important one of all, in my opinion, my estimation. My, my listeners will sympathize with my passion for this. This is Daniel chapter 9, verse 20, 26 and 27. This has to do with Daniel's 70th week, the most misunderstood passage in the entire Bible, to my estimation, at least with the most hideous consequences. It's because of the misunderstanding of this passage in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, Israel knew not the time of her visitation when Messiah came 2,000 years ago. Had they read and understood this passage, they would have been expecting their Messiah. They would have been waiting for him. And yet they missed him, and they slew him because of this misunderstood passage of the Bible. And it's this very same misunderstanding of Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, that allows futurists the same error. Just as the Jews knew not the time of their visitation, the futurists will not know the time of their visitation either. The consequences were grave 2,000 years ago. The consequences of not knowing the time of the coming of the Messiah can be read in history and in the Bible itself. Unspeakable. What will be the consequences of misunderstanding this passage today by the futurists? Listen to what it says. From the authorized King James Version. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Daniel's 70th week. One week he confirmed the covenant with many. And then he confirms it with his own blood. And God ripped the veil of the temple, putting a permanent end to animal sacrifices. They were not to pass through that veil without blood. 
They were only to pass through that veil to make sacrifice for the nation of Israel once a year. And Jesus was that sacrifice. And God put an end to it by ripping the veil of the temple, exposing the Holy of Holies. That happened 2,000 years ago by the one and only Messiah who was prophesied to come precisely when Daniel prophesied it to be, after the 69th week, at the beginning of the 70th. First, there were seven weeks of years, then 62 weeks of years, making 69 weeks of years altogether, that leaving only one week of years remaining. That's when Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan. Three and a half years later, he sat, caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by becoming the sacrifice himself, confirming the covenant, bringing in everlasting righteousness, a kingdom of princes and kings. But the futurists believe the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, that it has not been fulfilled. What are they doing but denying that Jesus was the Messiah? It had consequences, grave consequences, not knowing the time of their visitation. Jerusalem was completely destroyed. It was besieged by the Romans. A million people starved to death in the conflagration. The temple was reduced to level. Every stone, not one stone upon the other remained. Desolation. Complete and utter desolation. A million people starved to death who weren't killed by the sword. What will be the consequences today in saying that that 70th week of Daniel is yet in the future? Messiah has not come. That's what they're saying. Oh, yes, I know they say they believe Jesus was the Messiah, but out of the other side of their mouth, they say the seventh week is yet future. You can't have it both ways. You simply cannot have it both ways. When you say the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, you have literally denied that Jesus was the Messiah, that he confirmed the covenant with many for one week, that he gave his life a ransom for many. You're denying all of it. The fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel <coughs> occurred just as Daniel prophesied it. And it's because the Jews didn't understand this prophecy and were forbidden even by the priest to read it to discover the timing of the arrival of the Messiah. They missed their Messiah. Consequences of that error are incalculable. And they are recorded in history just as is all the fulfillment of Bible prophecy recorded in history. That's how we know it's fulfilled. So what will be the consequences of those who predict a future 70th week of Daniel? It can be but one thing, and that is to present to them a false Christ, a false Messiah, the consequences of which will be incalculable. Okay, there's just too much wisdom and knowledge from the authorized King James rendering of this passage, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. It reveals the error and the consequences of the Jews 2,000 years ago who slew their own Messiah. And it also indicates the tremendous incalculable error of those who believe in a future Antichrist, a future 70th week of Daniel. Well, we can't allow the King James Version to warn God's people, and particularly not King James Version, chapter 9 of Daniel. So they have to write it out. They have to pervert it. No matter what it costs, they have to replace Daniel's prophecy with a perversion, a lie. And here it is, the New International Version. The Jesuit Bible, quote, After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. Did you get that? After 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. Is, is that what is in the King James Version? It says, and in the King James Version, it says, and after three score and two weeks, 62 weeks of years, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. That means he, did, he died for us. He shed his innocent blood for us, for our redemption. But in the NIV Jesuit Bible, it says after 62 sevens, the anointed one, 
capital A, capital O, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. You can't get more perverted than that. It continues, the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations will have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offerings. <clears throat> and on a wing of the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is pour out, poured out on him, unquote. Can you arrive at anything even close to the truth in reading the NIV? Remember, it's the most popular perversion in the churches today. With that rendering, how could you ever possibly recreate the true in the King James Version. Once you pass through the dark doors of the NIV, I don't see a, a way to get out of it except by the infinite glory and grace of Almighty God. I was brought out of it. It can be done, but only by the power of Almighty God. We need to pray for all of those who read the NIV and all these other Bible perversions that God would rescue them. In the Good News Bible, <laughs> it's rendered this way, and at the time of the end, God's chosen leader will be killed unjustly. The city and the temple will be destroyed by the invading army of a powerful ruler. The end will come like a flood, bringing the war and destruction which God has prepared. The ruler will have a firm agreement with many people for seven years, and when half this time is passed, he will put an end to sacrifices and offerings. The awful horror will be placed on the highest point of the temple and will remain there until the one who put it there meets the end which God has prepared for him. How could one ever, out of that mess, reconstruct the true, the biblical, the historical, the prophetic, fulfillment of that prophecy 2,000 years ago as recorded in the authorized King James Version of the Bible. Only God could mend. Now, how about that burning barrel out in the backyard? Can we burn them today? Every last one of them? I say we should. I'll be back tomorrow. Inquisition update on First Amendment Radio. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border 
crossthborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossthborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthborder.org.